You're listening to Truth To You with Jono, and you can download these programs freely from the website at truthtoyou.org. That's truth number two, letter U dot org. And it is time for the pearls from the Torah portion with Keith Johnson in Charlotte, Nehemia Gordon in Jerusalem. Gentlemen, welcome back to the program. So Thanks, Jono. Going. Thanks for having us. It's good to have you. It's good to have you. And good day to Q listening in Houston, Texas, and Maureen listening in Indiana and everyone else, where everybody else, wherever you may be around the world, thank you for your company. And uh, I just want to say today is a little bit of a, a different kind of a program. We, um, uh, I should let everybody know that uh, we are pre-recording this program. I know it's February. We recorded this program on January the 10th. And the reason why I'm letting you know, dear listeners, is because... Uh, today, Keith and I got an email from Nehemia uh, earlier today saying, listen, can we postpone the program because uh, Georgia, uh, Nehemia's dog, was sick? We said, sure, no problem. And uh, we got an email a little bit later in the day saying, Georgia, uh, Nehemia's faithful canine companion, she passed away. And uh, Nehemia was determined to go ahead and do the program and uh, dedicate it to the memory of Georgia, which uh, you know we're very, very happy to do. And uh, Nehemia, I just want to say, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. My condolences. It's a terrible thing to lose, uh, not just yeah. a pet, but a faithful companion uh, and one of so many years as well. Yeah. But uh, but thank you for coming on to to do this program. Yeah, and I was explaining to you guys before because Keith kind of in shock. How can we possibly do the show today? <clears throat> and uh, you know, here I'm I'm drawing strength from from the the heritage of, of Israel's um, uh, military uh, victories. And one of the things in Israeli military doctrine is that when you suffer, uh, especially if it's a crushing defeat, you don't go back and lick your wounds and you don't run away. The first thing that you do <clears throat> is you launch an immediate counterattack. Mm -hmm. And the enemy has struck a crushing blow against me today. Mm -hmm. And so I can't think of anything better than to launch a counterattack and, and talk about the Word of God. Amen. And that's what I want to do today. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a. Uh, it's for me. Um, yesterday, all yesterday, I was uh, monitoring the situation, hearing about what Nehemia was doing with George, and having been there with him, being with her, walking her, thinking of how I was going to be seeing her. It, it really is a. It's it's really something that um people would have to understand, in terms of uh, how faithful of a a dog she has been, and so this will be a little bit difficult um uh, for for all of us. I think George is very famous. Uh, and if you've ever been with her, there's there's not a better dog that I've ever been around. So we're mm. going to do our best to get through the Torah pearls and uh, open up the Word of God and see if we can be inspired to to uh, as Nehemia said to do a counterattack. Mm. But we do uh, we do certainly um, you know think of Nehemia and and really all of the people that were connected uh, to her. She was really a really a wonderful dog. So mm. so be it, my friends. Amen. 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 So let's get into it, uh, because really this is a gem-packed, I mean, this is one of the crown jewels of Torah portions, is it not, in the Torah? Mm -hmm. And it is, it's one to get, it's one to indulge in, and I don't doubt that we're going to get into it. This one is uh, entitled Yitro, which, uh, Nehemia, am I right in saying that that is the Hebrew name for Jethro, right? Absolutely, yes. Okay, that makes perfect sense. And it's Exodus 18, verse 1 to uh, chapter 20, verse 26, and it begins like this. And Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that Jehovah had brought them out of Egypt, uh, Israel out of Egypt. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back. Now, hang on a minute. That's yeah, the end of that. That's that's the end of verse two. There's some information we weren't. So this is new well, information, right? Before we get to mm -hmm. her, I just have this question, and this this really is something I've thought about for a long time. So whenever I hear priest of Midian, immediately I I think negative when I think priest of Midian. I think you know ancient um, in Israel at that time, mm -hmm. and and you know there was the mountain of Elohim, uh, mountain of God, and 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 yet I, I'm wondering who who's doing the. Um, Who's doing the changing here? So, so uh, Jethro knows that this is, you know, there's this mountain of God. Most, Moses goes to the mountain. God has this experience. Yehovah tells him to go to Egypt. All of these things, and and I'm wondering if that changed uh, Jethro's view of who God was to mm. him. And and the reason I ask that is just because before Moses, I'm wondering if we were dealing priest of Midian with the ancient 
you know, um, whatever we want to call that, the, whatever the religion it was that was that was going on there. And then mm. you have this sort of personal interaction encounter with his son-in-law. And if that changed his view of who who God was, mm-hmm. do we know anything about the the priest of Midian, the, 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 whatever that religion was in the, in that particular well, region? It's real. It's really interesting because there's there's two uh, traditional views of of uh, Jethro in the Jewish sources, and uh, and you can actually see one of them reflected in the movie uh, The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, mm-hmm. one of my favorite movies of all time, but a very inaccurate portrayal of the events. And in that movie, uh, Jethro is portrayed as a descendant of Abraham, and he knows the, the one true God of Abraham. And he actually mm-hmm. refers to him as – there's a scene where, where uh, Moses, played by Charlton Heston, has just come out of the desert after fleeing from, uh, from Pharaoh. And, uh, and he says how he had this you know, difficult journey across the desert. And Jethro says, kind of casually, he says, the God who has no name has guided your steps. And Moses says, the God who has no name, you too worship the God of Abraham? Because in the movie they portray Yehovah, the creator of heaven and earth, as the God who has no name. That's right. And, uh, and, and so Jethro is portrayed as a priest of Midian uh, according to the faith of Abraham, worshiping the one true God. Uh-huh. Now, whether that's true or not is really a matter of dispute. It's interesting. There's, there's a religion based in Israel called the Druze. And most people have probably never heard of them outside of Israel. But the Druze, uh, they say the Jews follow Moses, mm-hmm. and the Christians follow Jesus, and the Muslims follow Muhammad, and mm-hmm. the Druze, they say, follow Jethro. And their mm-hmm. main shrine, located in northern Israel, uh, a few miles from Tiberias, is the tomb of Jethro to this very day. And they say mm-hmm. that Jethro was a faithful monotheist and that he taught uh, essentially the same about the same God, they say, as all as uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. That, that's what the Druze say. Now, uh, I, I'm not sure you can really support that from what we read in this Torah portion, because in verse 10 and 11, is a really powerful section here. Mm. Jethro says, Blessed is Jehovah, who has delivered you from the hand of Egypt and from the hand of Pharaoh. And then in verse 11, he says, Now I know that Jehovah is greater than all the gods. Mm. There it is. So, there it is. Uh, so the other tradition in Judaism says, well, actually, wait a minute. Jethro was worshipped all the gods. He was, he was, you know, he was one of these people who worshipped every single god in existence. Mm. And when he heard about the god of Israel and his feats against Pharaoh and Egypt, he said, okay, that Yehovah is the greatest of the gods, based mm. on this verse. Mm. Well, that's why I, it's it's just so interesting. I, I love I love when you uh, you know this this little little term I come up with. It's called keep reading, keep yes. reading, keep reading, and, and the concept <laughs> itself <laughs> really came from the time keep of study. Keep reading, with, yeah, keep reading, <laughs> because um, you know you, you, we could stop right there and make make guesses, but I think Nehemiah, based on what you just brought forward in the, a few verses later, answers that the evangelism went from Moses to Jethro, not from Jethro to Moses. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, okay. So it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because in uh, Nehemiah, as you pointed out, uh, verse 11, now I know that Jehovah is greater than all the gods, for it goes on to uh-huh. say, for in the very thing in which they behaved proudly, he was above them. Uh, mm. so, so you're right. He seems to be placing, uh, rather than saying Jehovah is the one true God, he's placing them above. Well, so in the Hebrew, it doesn't say he was above them. Uh-huh. It says uh, literally for for concerning the matter which they uh, dealt dealt um, and zadu, zadu could be you translate. I mean, it's to deal with um, to do something uh, maliciously and and not just proudly, but to do it maliciously and intentionally for the mm-hmm. very de- matter that they dealt maliciously uh, concerning them. And so what he's talking about here is is the actually it sounds to me like he, he may even be alluding to the plague of the firstborn. That Pharaoh wanted to wipe out all the males of, of Israel, and, and mm-hmm. in that very matter, which they they dealt uh, uh, contemptuously and maliciously against them, that's how he was. Uh, Pharaoh was was defeated and, and smitten. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. And so when he heard about the plagues and everything that happened to Pharaoh, he said, "Okay, well, this is the greatest god. There's no question about that. Mm. You know, the Egyptians they're experts at the gods. They have these professional priests mm. who uh, their full time job is to appease the gods, and they couldn't stand up to the god of Israel." Mm-hmm. There well, is. I know, I know, we, I know. We, we we did go to ten, but we've we've got to we got to now back up just a little bit here because yeah, uh, this... yeah, Zip- Zipporah. Zipporah, <laughs> I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you ask the question, Jono. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I I did a little bit of digging, and I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, the last we heard of Zipporah uh, was mm-hmm. when she threw the foreskins at Moses's feet. <laughs> uh, I mean, is that right? That's right. 
And That's apparently right. the consequence of that incident is that he divorced her. And uh, the reason I say that is the word in verse 2, it says, uh, And Jethro, the uh, father-in-law of Moses, took Zipporah, the wife of Moses, achar shilucheha, which you could translate literally as after he sent her away. But that word sent her away, that's the biblical Hebrew word for divorce. Mm -hmm. So you could legitimately translate this after he divorced her. It's so, interesting, so, isn't it? Is, 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 is Jethro playing uh, the reconciler? What's going on here, Nehemiah? He's trying to reconcile. Moses divorced his wife and he said, look, you've got these two boys with her. Get back with her. And... Mm -hmm. uh, and evidently, ladies and gentlemen, uh, la ladies, and gentlemen ladies and gentlemen, we have to slow down here. We're just going to have to take we're just going to have to take a moment because uh, you're telling me that in the English we have no 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 sense that uh, this was a technical term of uh, being divorced. When you read it in the Hebrew, Nehemiah, are you saying you slow down and think about this, or do you move quickly, or you just assume no, that, that it, that's the word? It just I would just if I were to translate this you know uh, freehand, I would I would translate it after he divorced her. Because that's what that word means. That is consistently the Hebrew word for divorce, mm -hmm. the PL form of the verb, verb shalach, uh, to send away uh, when referring to a woman. And, and the reason mm -hmm. is that basically before the Torah was given, all divorce really consisted of was you would, you would you know, let's, I'll call a spade a spade. You'd kick the woman out of the house mm -hmm. and send her away, you know, usually to her father's house and uh, if he had a father. And, uh, you know, later on in Deuteronomy 24, Moses uh uh, reveals this commandment that not only do you send her away, but you have to give her a document saying that she's sent away and saying that she's divorced and she's now free to marry anybody she wants. Um, whereas, you know, this kind of left her in a state of limbo. Is she, her, uh, is, is she married to this guy? Isn't she? He kicked her out. Well, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of subjective. Whereas, you know, with the document, that's legal proof. So, but in this period of history, this was divorce. That's all divorce consisted of kicking the woman out of the house. Mm. So for those people that are listening right now, you know, there's there's just such this huge there's huge issue when we've talked about divorce, talked about it for years, how these different issues, never in all the conversations, being a pastor, dealing with people, circumstances, never in all of my uh, many many discussions regarding this have I ever heard that uh, that based on the the wording here that we would see that Moses actually sent his wife away from the perspective of in ancient times of uh, being divorced. This is mm. this is a, something to slow down with. And uh, we've, I've, I want to thank you, Nehemiah, for for reading word by word, letter by letter, accent by accent, jot by jot, and tittle by tittle. As a result, it seems to us that uh, that, that that this would be that Moses was divorced, and his his father in law is bringing the wife back it and saying, "Hey, here she is." Seems, yeah, it seems to be a possibility mm -hmm. that that has to be considered. And uh, and so what you're saying, uh, Nehemiah, is possibly Jethro is uh, playing the marriage counselor, if you like, saying, "Oh, definitely, she is. definitely, yeah." I mean, this is this is the whole point of mentioning the sons. Like, okay, there's two children here. You guys, you know, it didn't work out. You had some kind of thing going on with, with foreskins and flint knives. And, you know, let, let, let's put that aside. It's a and get pretty back stressful and, situation. I can understand. You know, I, know, you know. I don't know exactly yeah. what it was. She told me it had something to do with. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, you're a bride from the blood to her and, blood and all, you know. <laughs> She called you names, and I'm not sure. What the name <laughs> come on, come on. You know, you guys like each other, really. Come on. <laughs> That's all behind you now, and the boys are fine, and they've yeah. forgotten about it. Come on, <laughs> right? Okay, so uh, so yeah, no, we've we've got it. To, uh, I hope we have time to do this. We we really have to take a few minutes, dedicate a few minutes to talking about Jethro, because mm. he's one of the most interesting characters in the Bible, in my opinion. Truly, um, right. first of all, let's start about talking about what his name is. And in rabbinical tradition, it says that he had seven names. Um, biblically speaking, there's definitely. Uh, Three names that he clearly is referred to as uh, the the most common uh, name he's that's used in reference to him is you know of course Jethro itself Yitro, but then he's also called uh, Yeter or Jether in English and that's an Exodus 14. Now that's not a big deal. That's like I don't know Mike and Michael. You know Yeter was a short form of Yitro, mm -hmm. but then in Exodus 2:18 and Numbers 10:29 he's referred to as Reuel. And in oh. fact in a single passage. Uh, and I believe it's over there in Exodus, he's referred to as Reuel and as Yitro, um, as Jethro. Hmm. So uh, in, in that single context of when Moses first meets that family. So which one is he? And apparently Yitro may have actually been one of his, may have actually been a title rather than um, rather than his name. Or then maybe Reuel was his title. That's the other possibility. Reuel means go. shepherd of God. Shepherd of God. So maybe, what, sorry, sorry yeah, what does or, Yitro or mean? It could mean? Or it could also mean God's shep God shepherd. Uh -huh. Yitro, it's a really interesting question because Yeter can mean excellent. Um, that's what it, uh, 
that's a possible meaning of it. Or um, it could also mean uh, more or extra, uh, but mm -hmm. probably it means something like excellent or, uh, uh, you know, very great. So Yitro is his great one, maybe, okay. um, his excellent one. Um, and then Ruel would be God shepherds or something to the effect of that, or shepherd of God, possibly. Mm. Uh, so these may, well, all these may be title, titles. And then uh, there's another character who uh, it appears to be, you know, the rabbis say that's Jethro himself, but if you read it in the in the context, it seems to actually be Jethro's son, a man named Chovav, which means beloved. And there's an important story related to him in Numbers chapter 10, verses 29 to 32. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll talk more about when we get to that. But basically, he was tra he and his clan were tr continued to travel with the Israelites apparently after the father Jethro went home. And at a certain point, Moses comes to him and, and the clan and says, look, you know, you know all the places we've camped. You need to stay with us. And they say, no, no, we want to go home. We're fine. Uh, you can trust us. And he's like, no, you're going to be traveling with us. <laughs> and evidently, these people remained among the Israelites, uh, these uh, kinsmen of Jethro, Chobab, uh, you know, who is essentially Moses' brother-in-law, the son of his uh, father-in-law, his, uh, sis his um, wa wife's brother. And... Um, and then we have the, this group of people called the Canaanites, who are the family of Jethro. And that's specifically mentioned in um, uh, Judges 1.16. It says, and the son of the Canaanite, um, and so the, the rabbis say that the Canaanite here in, being referred to is Jethro. Um, and that's clear, clear the case from the context. And the son mm -hmm. of the Canaanite, the father-in-law of Moses, went up from the city of Dates, uh, which is uh, in Gedi, uh, with the children of Judah into the desert of Judah, which is by the Negev of Arad, uh, and they went and they dwelt with the people. So there are these Canaanites, these kinsmen of Jethro, who are uh, who are in, who are dwelling in the land of Israel. And then in one Samuel fifteen six, they're mentioned again as living in the same area as the um, as the Amalekites. And when Saul comes to wipe out the Amalekites, he says to the Canaanites, "Okay, you guys got to separate yourselves from the Amalekites because they're going to all be killed." And they they actually do separate themselves. Now here's the here's what Keith would call the money ball. And I Here looked comes. up this term money ball that Keith uses all the time. <laughs> I love it. And, and now that I know what it means, I love it. The money ball is that ball in, in the lottery that if you hit that number, you double your, 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 uh, your, your winnings. Mm -hmm. And so this is the money ball. 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55. It's a little verse buried there in the middle of nowhere. Who would even pay attention to it? It's all, it's all the gats and all the names. <laughs> it says, well, I'm not the one who discovered this. Uh, this is actually ancient Jewish commentators picked up on this. Mm -hmm. It says, in the family of scribes who dwelt in uh, Jabez, the Teratites and the Shemites and the Sukkotites, then the Kenites who came from Hamat, which may be the name of a person or possibly a, a, a town somewhere, the father of the house of Rechav. So we have these Kenites who are the, we know are the kinsmen of of, um, of Jethro, uh, the father-in-law of Moses, and, and one of them came from this place called Hamath, and he's the father of the house of Rechav. Okay, well, so what? Who's the house of Rechav? Whoever heard of that? And that's not to be confused with Rachav uh, or Rechav, the uh, the prostitute mentioned in the book of Joshua, because that's what the different Hebrew letter the Rechav is with the uh, that's what the Chet is with the Chet. So the house of Rechav is mentioned in one chapter of the Bible, which is Jeremiah chapter 35. Here and it there's comes, an amazing story and there, and it talks about, uh, this is during the time of the Babylonian uh, siege of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and God says to Jeremiah, bring the bring the Rechabites, the people of the house of Rechab, and bring them into the, a certain place and, and give them wine. Tell them to drink the wine. And so Jeremiah does it, and, uh, and their response in verse 6 is, and they said, we cannot drink wine. For Yonadav, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, You shall not drink wine, you or your sons forever, and you shall not build a house, and you shall not plant seed, and uh, you shall not plant a vineyard, and vineyards you shall not plant for you, um, for you shall dwell in tents all your days. Etc. Uh, and then he goes on, he says, For that you will live many days on the land which you are <clears throat> sojourning in it uh, there. And that's a really interesting word for sojourning. That's, that usually refers to some. It doesn't say dwelling. It says sojourning, mm -hmm. and the word garim ger usually refers to somebody who is landless. And all of the the physical descendants of Jacob back in in that period, we talked about this when we did Exodus 12. They they were given land when Joshua divided up the land. But if you were a sojourner, one of that mixed multitude, you didn't get land, um, and you were a sojourner. So this this these these this particular group of Canaanites, the house of Rechav. They said, okay, look, we don't have land. We don't want to be dependent on anybody. We don't want to be in debt. We don't want to owe anybody. 
We want to be free and independent. And the way to have that type of lifestyle in, in this economy, you know, back then, in that in that socioeconomic system, is to raise sheep and goats and and animals that can graze off the land. But if you if you are dependent on uh, buying wine and drinking wine and, and planting vineyards, well, you need to buy land to 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 plant the vineyards. And you know, back then they couldn't really buy land. All they could do was lease it for 49 years, because in the 50th year in the jubilee, it went back to the original in. Uh, the original people who who uh, had inherited from their fathers. So the Rechabites didn't have any land like that. So all they could do was rent land for 49 years. So their ancestor, Jonah Dav, he was a really smart guy. He said, look, we're not going to build houses and we're not going to plant vineyards. We're not going to be dependent on anybody. We're going to live as as Bedouin, as shepherds, uh, traveling around the, as nomads, just like our ancestors did. We know how to do this. This is our ancestral way of life. We don't, and and the main thing is don't drink wine because if you drink wine, well, wine has to live, ha, has to be grown. You know, mm-hmm. a, a vine is something that you don't just plant one year; it grows year after year after year. And so they, de- they you know, generation after generation, they'd be dependent. They'd essentially be in debt. And he's saying we don't want to be in debt. We want to be free, independent people. Now, why is all this important? Because uh, God looks at this and he says, "Wow, these people, their ancestor told them he made them to take a vow that they wouldn't plant vineyards or build houses." And that they would live this uh, this um, nomadic lifestyle, and you know what? They could have said, "No, I don't want to do that. I don't want to take the vow," and uh, and lived any way they wanted. But they accepted that from their their ancestor, and they were so faithful to it that it became a a, a picture of what God was calling Israel to do. And He says that over in verse um, here. It's in verse fourteen. It says, uh, "Let's see." It says, "For they have they have obeyed the commandment of their father." And I spoke to you, this is now God saying to Israel, it says, you know, these, these Rechabites, the house of Rechab, they, they uh, listened to the house of their ancestor, Yehonadav, um, which, whose name, by the way, means Yehovah gives freely. Um, mm-hmm. It says, uh, the, the words of Yehonadav, the son of Rechab, have been established that, this is verse 14 of Jeremiah 35, have been established that he commanded his sons to not drink wine, to not uh, uh, drink until this, until this very day, for they have obeyed the commandment of the Father. And I spoke to you, waking up early in the morning and speaking, and you did not listen to me. And I sent to you all my servants, the prophets, waking up at more, waking up early and sending them, mm-hmm. saying, return each man from his evil way and do right in your, in your, in your actions. Don't go after other gods to serve them, etc., etc." So God's saying, look, I gave you these commandments, and I'm God. You've got to listen to me. You've got no mm-hmm. choice. You must obey me. And uh, you didn't obey me. And the Rechabites who could have said, I don't want to take that vow that my ancestor imposed uh, on, on his descendants. I, I, I don't want to be involved in that. And they not only weren't accepted that, that ruling of their ancestor, they did it faithfully to the T. And God mm. said, why can't you be more like the Rechabites? And now for the money ball in verse 19. Mm. Therefore, thus says Yehovah of hosts, the God of Israel, there shall not be cut off a man from the house of Yenodad, the son of Rechab, standing before me all the days. Now, why is that a money ball? Because that's a really interesting promise. There shall not be cut off a man uh, standing before me all the days. God made that promise to three families. Three families in the book of Jeremiah get that promise, that there will always be a continuing descendant from that family standing before Yehovah. And the three, and the other two are in Jeremiah 33. So we have the house of Rechav, who is a descendant of the kinsmen of Jethro. I mean, they're not mm-hmm. physical descendants of Israel, but they've become part of Israel. They're the... They're the sojourners. They're the grafted in, the uh, the ones who've joined themselves to Yehovah. Come on, the other two come families on, on, are the house of David and the house of Aaron, the, the line of, the, of the priests. So there will always be a priest, someone from the line of the priests. There will always be someone from the line of the priest, someone from the line of the king, and there will always be someone from the house of Rechab, those that represent this group of, of the mixed multitude who joined themselves to the God of Israel and the people of Israel. Those are the three that got that promise. You know, my ancestors who were from one of the other 11 tribes uh, of Jacob, they didn't get that promise. But the house mm-hmm. of Rechab, because they were so obedient to Jehovah, got that promise. So that's an amazing thing to me, that God singled out those three families to get the promise. And the third one, this house of Rechab, they're not even physically descended from Jacob. Mm-hmm. Can I get an amen? Wow. you got to get an amen, Nehemiah. And the reason I think that this is so, so, so important the concept under that family being able to live by a vow, the vow, in other words, the vow mm-hmm. is here's here's the vow. The vow is we're not gonna drink wine. Okay, do you swear do you swear that this will be the vow for our family name and for our family yes, this is the vow. And is this not important that when when we when we learn the significance of vowing, 
something mm. and believing something and, and and I mean, I mean, I just I just think this. You know, I mean, I mean, the first time you ever told me that, Nehemiah, I just thought to myself, well, maybe maybe somehow I can connect Johnson to Jethro. I don't know. I, I've, <laughs> I've got to find a way, Jono and Nehemiah. I think no Jews have fallen out, but maybe I'm a Jethroite. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> just. <laughs> mm, my goodness. Okay. Thank you, Nehemiah, because that's all. That's yeah. really, that's news to me. That's incredible. Yeah, it's amazing. Now, one more thing to tie, tie in here, and this really doesn't have anything to do with it, except that it's another person who was not who was not a physical descendant of Israel, who was blessed by Jehovah because of his obedience and faith in God, and that's Caleb. Uh, Caleb is mentioned later on in the book of Numbers, and we'll get to him, but the reason I want to talk to about him just very briefly today, two minutes, is that Caleb's name is from the word caliph, meaning dog. So in mm. honor of George, I want to talk about how Caleb, Caleb was a picture of a dog in that he yes. was faithful to Jehovah. And we had the 12, tri- the 12 spies, one from each tribe, go and report on the land. Mm. And this is in Book of Numbers. Uh, it talks about this. And 10 of them brought back the evil report of the land, saying, look, there's giants there. We have no chance against them. Mm. We don't, we, we're, we're not going to be able to defeat them. You know, we should just forget about this. Maybe we should go back to Egypt. Mm-hmm. And Caleb, uh, who is not even a physical descendant of Israel, because we're told he's Caleb, the son of Yefuna, the mm-hmm. Kenizzite. The Kenizzites were one of the original ten Canaanite tribes that lived in the land. They apparently had many people who were down in Egypt as slaves, and some of them left Egypt with the Israelites. And so Caleb, who is a Kenizzite, a type of Canaanite, uh, he's one of the two people, along with Joshua, Moses' uh, disciple, yes. who stand up and say, no, Jehovah can deliver this into our hand. We have nothing to fear. Now, it's really interesting because when Caleb is re- recounting the story in the book of Joshua, he sends a message to Joshua saying, you remember wh- when this thing happened and, uh, and how we were in the land of saw giants. Mm. You know, and that's one of the things that they say, that we saw giants and they were giants. We were giants in their eyes and they were giants. In, uh, let's see, no, uh, he and we were we grasshoppers were as, in, in, in their eyes. We were as grasshopper in their eyes and in our own eyes. Mm. And, you know, Caleb and Joshua, uh, in, you know, basically Caleb is later admitting that, yes, these guys were giants. That doesn't matter. We can still defeat them. We don't have to mm. fear them. we got to stand up to the giants, stand the giant, look the giant in the eyes, call the name of Jehovah, and defeat them rather than running scared from the giants. Amen. Um, the other ten uh, spies said, oh, yeah, they're giants. we got to run away. We're, we're afraid of those guys. Um, so Caleb, and it's actually interesting, it's not the facts that were in dispute. The facts were indisputable, that they were standing up against giants. It was, mm. what do we do about that? Do we run scared or do we do we trust in Jehovah and, and face our enemies? And uh, Caleb and Joshua, they were as faithful as a dog. And when a dog is standing next to you, you got, you know, you, you know that dog is not going to not gonna disappoint you. Mm. You know, he, he trusts in you and it's his trust in you that gives him the ferocity to do what he needs to do and, and to bark and to, uh, you know, and, and to defend you. And that was Caleb in, in that day. And he also was not a physical descendant of Israel, just like the house of Rechab. And now we should get back to the Torah portion. <laughs> okay, yes. and there it is, ladies and gentlemen. And you have licensed Nehemiah to talk about Caleb, dogs, anything you want to throughout this whole time. <laughs> That's right. I'm and so you. far, I mean, my goodness, we we could this easily we could just wrap it up there. There's, my brain no, no, is so full. Now. No, no, there's so much. So You've been much listening to about. truth to you, and <laughs> and we've only got we've only got to the second verse. No, ch- no. Chapters nine, twenty. <laughs> We're gonna get to that's, the mount. That's I love brilliant, it. Caleb, yes, because he had a different spirit. Oh, look, I tell you, when we get to that, I've got a story for you too. I I, I love that story. Okay, we're moving on. We're moving on. Uh, with her two sons who she, um, oh, okay, the two sons, uh, of whom the name of one was Gershom, uh, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land, and the name of the other was Eliezer. Okay. That's mm-hmm. like uh, as in Abraham's servant, right, Eliezer? Exactly, uh, same name. For he, okay, so uh, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered. Now, this is interesting, Keith. Uh, delivered, I think, let me just read this bit because I, I think delivered appears, or noted to me, I think about five times. Here we go. Deliver me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' uh, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he in, was encamped at the mountain of God. And he said to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming uh, to you with your wife and her two sons with her. So Moses went to meet his father-in-law, bowed down, kissed him, and uh, they had a bit of a chat. And uh, and then it goes on to say that that Yehovah had delivered them. Then Jethro rejoiced uh, all the good which Yehovah had done for Israel 
uh, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be Jehovah, who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. And uh, I just, Keith, I just find it interesting. There is an emphasis on, on the deliverance of Jehovah there. Yeah, and of course, in my, my translation in the, 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 the NIV here, uh, ho- holding it and looking here, the, the word they choose to use here is rescued over and over again. Rescued, rescued, rescuing, rescued, etc. So mm-hmm. uh, I'm thinking they don't want us to make a connection with uh, what the word is. I suppose if we ask Nehemiah what that word is for uh, deliverance, uh, rescuing, Nehemiah, what does it say in the Hebrew Bible? So verse 4 is vayatzilini, which is mm-hmm. from the word hitzil, and they usually translate that as delivered. That's not the you know that's not the word that Keith gets all excited about. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, I'm not getting excited Yeshua. about this. Yeah, Jono, Jono is the it's, one who's brought this up. Roots. Okay, um, it's a different root. The one that you use properly translated to save salvation. And mm-hmm. then in verse 10, it's also heat seal, the same exact word um, that actually that appears twice. Um, that also same one that appears in verse four. It appears twice in verse 10. And what's the third verse? Uh, verse nine, also verse eight. Oh, uh, verse nine is also heat silo. Heat in this verse heat seal. Um, to deliver, and verse 8, um, yeah, also by Yatzileim, also from Hitzil. So there is, is, he repeatedly uses this particular word, Hitzil, which is to deliver, not the word that's usually translated as to save. Um, it has a similar sort of meaning, I suppose. Mm, yeah. Okay. No, it just struck me because it was a, a word that's used uh, repeatedly in this, uh, in this passage here, and it just uh, emphasizes the deliverance of Yehovah, which I like. From uh, yeah. verse 13, and so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and, uh, and the people stand before you from morning until evening? And Moses said, well, you know, to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. And this is interesting this is, because this, this is, is before this is before the uh, the Mount Sinai events uh, that uh, Moses is making known the statutes of God and his laws. What do you make of it? Well, it's really interesting because you know I I was taught that Moses went up to Mount Sinai well, for forty days and forty nights and received the entire Torah, and that's not <laughs> that's actually not said anywhere in scripture what it says in scripture is he received the ten commandments up there on mount sinai mm-hmm. and it's very clear as you read throughout the torah there'll be a section that'll you know be maybe even a 10 verses long a little section that'll be, begin and Jehovah spoken to moses saying and each one of those little sections evidently is a separate revelation mm-hmm. and uh and that's what this seems to be referring to that there were there was a series of many many revelations uh over time that moses had over a period of 40 years and as he was he would get these and people would come to him with problems. He would get wait. these revelations, and he would no, share no. them with the people. And and, and no, so that's no, no, actually wait. this is actually a very important verse. Okay. No, no, you no. This is not. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Hold on. Okay. Okay. You say the Ten Commandments what? is your what? most important, uh, favorite movie. So, it's been mine before I ever went into a church. I never knew anything about the okay. church. Look, and uh, so Moses went up there. He got the Ten Commandments. He came down. But it's always been my understanding that that's where he got the whole revelation. What is this? What, what do you? I mean, are you gonna are you gonna take that away from me now? Well, it, well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because just well, in uh, last says. week's <laughs> last week's Torah portion, we were discussing uh, Exodus chapter sixteen, which has so much emphasis on Shabbat, and we haven't got to Exodus chapter twenty yet. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, right. so can we slow down and look at this verse one more time? And and can you read the verse and and say the verse number Jono and read it nice and slow, and then I'm, and then I'm gonna read it nice and slow and uh, go okay. ahead. So this is this is verse sixteen of chapter eighteen of Exodus. Uh, when they, Moses is telling his father-in-law, when they have difficulty, they come to me, I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. Okay, so just a second. So it says, whenever they have a dispute, it is brought unto me, and I decide between the parties and inform them if God's decrees and L-A-W-S and laws. Well, Nehemiah, we're just going to just have a Torah pearl here if you can. Can you read that for us in Hebrew? I mean, this is an important little word here. What does it say in Hebrew? Yeah, so Hodati um, Elohim uh, and I inform uh, of the statutes of Elohim of God and His Torot, His Torahs, and that's Uh-oh. an interesting term when it says Torahs there, uh, laws, really instructions. 
what it's mm -hmm. referring to are specific instructions about specific things. And you'll have a section, for example, in Leviticus that will open up and it'll say, this is the law of the burnt offering, and this is the law of the, of the, of the, sin, of the mm -hmm. sin offering, and this is the law of the guilt offering. And, and each one of those is called a Torah, an instruction. And mm -hmm. that's not to be – so each one of those is uh, Torah, Torah, and the plural is Torot, Torahs. Uh, that's not to be confused with the, the collective body of, of, of revelation, mm -hmm. which later on is referred to – actually, even in, at the end of Deuteronomy, it's referred to as the book of the Torah. Mm -hmm. um, and that is the collective book of instruction. There's not only one of those, which is what we call the five books of Moses. It has five sections. Uh, Genesis to Deuteronomy, mm. but there's really only one Torah. But within the Torah, there are many statutes, chukim and Torot and Mishpatim, and different types of commandments. And one of those types is an instruction. And actually, even even in the section uh, we had read uh, quite a while ago, um, when it talked about Abraham, it talked about how there was Torot. There, that he kept the Torot. He kept the the instructions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here that's, there it is. Uh, there it is. Okay. So Moses' uh, father-in-law said to him, the thing that you do is not good. Now, obviously, he's not referring to teaching the people the statutes of God and his laws. He goes on to say, both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you. You're not able to perform it by yourself. Listen now to my voice and I will give you counsel and God be with you. Stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them, the, you know, he repeats it, you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way which they must walk and the work they must do. So, there, again, we see two categories. We've got, we've got the, uh, the statutes and the laws and we've got uh, the way that they must walk and the work they must do. Uh, moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all times, and uh, it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it'll be easier for you. Now, thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, how, I mean, you know, maths wasn't my strongest subject. How, how does that work exactly? What, Keith, how does that, how do you visualize that? Well, it seems clear to me. I mean, he's, he's setting up an organizational uh, a way of dealing with things so that the, the toughest things get to Moses. Moses trains. This is a great uh, lesson in discipleship. Um, you know, Moses is basically um, charged with uh, teaching some people so that those people can uh, deal with some of those matters and some of those issues. So he's not dealing with everybody. He's dealing with things that they can't deal with, but that he's basically imparting uh, the instructions to them, and then they're able to handle this w amongst amongst these groups of people. Mm -hmm. okay. It's an extremely important passage. Um, I would say it's worthwhile because there's so much more to talk about in this Torah portion to save my comments for when we get to Deuteronomy 17. Mm -hmm. um, if I can hold out that long, I don't know. Okay. There's a couple other places where this comes up, This what he's describing here. This mm -hmm. is the, a picture, a, par a paradigm of the system that God has established and that it, essentially I, 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 hope, I hope I don't scare away um, people when I say that this is a picture of the Messiah, and I'm not going to say any more. Wow. What, what, <laughs> what are you going to leave us hanging on the edge of okay, the chair Okay, so ladies and long? gentlemen, please, whatever you do, no, let's don't... Move on, uh, don't <laughs> let's move on, that's it. Nehemi is about <laughs> to make some kind of... Uh, Fine, all right. So we got to wait till Deuteronomy <laughs> chapter <laughs> what? Uh, Jonah's going to jump. <laughs> verse, beginning in verse 8. <laughs> okay, let's all right. go. <laughs> all right. All right, moving right along. We're in uh, chapter 19. Uh, and I'd like to say, if, if it's okay here, I, yeah. I want to, something that's always been of very great interest to me, um, you know, I'm, I'm this this particular year, I've kind of, it's been, it's, been, it's been an amazing 10 years for me. And, and, and the first, you know, thing that happened for me when I went, when I went to Israel was this idea that I was to be there for the time of Shavuot. And, and um, that's something that's always caught me was just trying to get an idea around this actual time, the time frame. And when I read this in, in chapter 19, I get kind of excited. And I know there's a tradition here versus what we actually know in first of detail. But when I read in 19, in the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day, they came unto the desert of Sinai. And so um, I, I, don't, I, know, I know we can't get to the exact day, I mean, I know that there's a tradition. But is it, is it, is it fair for me to say we're close to the time uh, of Shavuot in the third month uh, after, they left, um, after they left Egypt? Hello? 
Yeah, I was in the bathroom. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you're going to edit that out, right? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have a This is one of the bloopers. Was that a tour for all? Well, Keith was talking. Know. I figured I could leave. <laughs> I don't talk to him. So, uh, <laughs> well, folks, uh, uh, <laughs> so in uh, Exodus 19, <laughs> so in the third month after the Israelites left Egypt or went off and did something, who knows, um, on that very day. So I was bringing this issue up, Nehemiah, about this idea of Shavuot being around that time. Tradition saying oh, that, amen. you know, it was Shavuot, but that we're around that time. And, and, and this just kind of catches my catches my attention because when I was called to Israel, it was at the time of Shavuot. Mm-hmm. And it, yep. there were three things that I was in, confronted with, time, Torah, and God's name. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. I've always been sort of um, stuck on this verse um, in this idea of it being the third month. Is there a real connection that we can biblically uh, base that idea that this is this is very close to the time of Shavuot? Well, it was a couple. I mean, look, I, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, I would have said definitely not. It doesn't say that. That's assuming something not said explicitly in Scripture. And you know what happens when you assume. But the more I, I uh, over the years think about it and study it, um, the more I'm convinced that there is a connection there. And, and one of the connections, well, one of the, the, the reasons for connecting the two is that, in fact, um, you know, Shavuot is the only feast that doesn't have a date. It doesn't right. have a date. It's not tied to a specific day of the month. It, it says to count 50 days after the Mara, after the Shabbat, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And uh, it doesn't have a specific date. And I think the fact that the revelation of Sinai also doesn't have a specific date, and they both take place early in the third month mm-hmm. and we don't know on what day of that month I, you know it can't be a, it's hard for me to believe that's an accident and i think more importantly is that moses repeatedly says to pharaoh we want to go out into the desert to bring sacrifices to our god for a chag for, for a, a hog and chag yes. is a specific term that means pilgrimage feast and there's only three chags in chagim in the hebrew year there's the feast of unleavened bread well that was the exodus there's Chag Shavuot, that's the Feast of Weeks, mm-hmm. and there is the Chag Sukkot, the Feast of Ingathering, and um, and the fact that this Chag coincides with the Chag that they had at Mount Sinai, I mean, it's hard, it, I just can't believe that's a coincidence, so there has to be a connection between Shavuot and the, uh, the revelation at Sinai. Essentially, I think we can now say, um, I feel confident saying now after all these years, that the Chag of Shavuot is the Chag of that revelation at Sinai of that thing that they were they were they kept saying to Pharaoh we've got to go do this in the desert we've got to go worship our God in the desert and have this experience and that's a Chag and then that Chag they actually have becomes I believe Chag of Shavuot the Feast of Weeks. Jono, the reason this is important is that for ten years uh, Nehemiah and I have talked about this we've sat in whirlpools and him. talked about it on planes trains and automobiles and now today he's finally willing to 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 make this connection so now I can I can I can say time torah and his name these things happened and and that and you know i've always felt like verse 19 i always felt like there was something so close to shavuot and uh, it just it's it's, exci- it's an exciting declaration today mm. so i want folks to know that this has been a big 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 verse for me and, and big time for us to talk about this so the now we can move is, on evidence is certainly compelling uh, verse 3 and moses went up to the mountain of, uh, went, went to god uh, yehovah called to him from the mountain saying thus you shall say to the house of jacob and tell the children of israel you have seen what I, I love this. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. I, I don't know why, but I just think that's a beautiful sentence. I bore you on eagles' wings and brought mm-hmm. you to myself. Isn't that beautiful? It now, therefore, beautiful. now, therefore, if conditional, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Now, Nehemiah, how, how are we to understand a kingdom of priests? Oh, I mean, I think the role of the priests is to um, teach the people about God. And I think the role of Israel is to teach the world about God. I think that's what it means to be a kingdom of priests. Okay. Amen. Well, okay. I want to give this a Torah pearl here, you all. I've, I've got to give this deep uh, Hebrew uh, letters. I'm looking in the NIV. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the NIV matches the Hebrew in this important thing I'm about to share. Mm. It is two little letters that I think are the most important two little letters in the entire 
um, scripture, um, both from the NIV, and I bet you there are two letters in the Hebrew, and Nehemiah, you can actually confirm for this or, or deny with if I'm going down the wrong, wrong, wrong road here. But the if, two little letters I tell my sons mm -hmm. all the time, these are the most important two little letters you can learn because there are many, many things that you can count on, and there are many, many things that you can and, and, and you know put your life based on. But this word, if you can get if, you mm -hmm. um, I-F, you uh, you understand a, a whole lot. So in my NIV it says I F. What's the Hebrew word for if in uh, in your in your your scriptures there, Nehemiah? The Hebrew word for if is im, uh -huh. which is the two Hebrew letters aleph mem. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a really interesting word. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, I was gonna, I was going to say something. <laughs> no 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 don't do it. No no no. Just okay stick okay we'll, we'll edit it out. No no, okay, no, no let's no no just stick let's stay right here. No, that, so that, that's, the, that's the aleph instead of the aleph in the top it's the aleph in the mem and the mem represents the water of the womb of Mary. Okay. And so you need Yeshua and Mary. You've got to pray to Mary too. That's the if. Okay. Edit that. Okay. Please no no. Edit that out. <laughs> no, no wait. Oh yeah sure sure I will don't worry about it. No but, but what's e really funny is there are people who say things that stupid that the oh, mem man, represents the the. The water, the the amniotic fluid in in the womb of Mary. There's no end to it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So let's move on. Uh, Jono, I don't know how you're going to fix that, but the if is important in the English and in the Hebrew because there is what you said, Jono, as you were reading. Hey, here's this. Here's this important. It's, it's, it's he's about to make this important statement. It says if, and mm -hmm. I'm telling you, if you did a study on if in the uh, in the English Bible or the Hebrew Bible, you might be surprised how many times the, those two little letters can mm. change what's going to happen. I suggest people uh, so always slow down when you hear the word if when you, or when you hear the word in if, Hebrew. Yeah, like I said, it's conditional. It's not yes. just going to come. It's not guaranteed. It's conditional. There's something mm -hmm. that we are required to do, and if we do that, then. And if is always followed by a then. I like that. It's just mm -hmm. well. and mm -hmm. uh, and the then is what we what we want if we are obedient. And uh, he put it to the people, and all the people answered together. They all answered together in unison and said. All that Yehovah has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to Yehovah. And Yehovah said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear, that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. Now, you know, we, we talked about this recently. Can I, can I just ask you, Nehemiah, uh, and believe you forever? Can I, just, can I just ask for your clarity there in the Hebrew? Sure, absolutely. Um, what he's saying here is the reason that he's speaking to all of Israel, to every man, woman, and child, is so that uh, they will, he's saying, so that in all, and also in you they will believe forever. Mm -hmm. Meaning that Israel will know that Moses isn't just sitting in a cave on the top of the mountain and making this up, that there really is a God speaking to him, and that all the things that, it, that are only revealed to Moses to then convey to the people uh, are true, and that's why God makes this revelation at Sinai, um, so mm -hmm. that they'll see that this is that this is for real. And in the entire history of mankind, there has never been a claim anywhere by anyone else that there's been a mass revelation that God Himself spoke to an entire nation of hundreds of thousands of people. It's never happened before or since. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and I think there's a reason for that because if somebody made up a story like that, somebody would call them on it. You know, look at mm -hmm. look at the history that's conveyed. In the, in the Tanakh, in what Christians refer to as the Old Testament, you have the worst sins and crimes of my ancestors. You have the adultery and murder uh, that David commits. You have the idolatry of the Israelites. You have all the worst sins laid out before, uh, before you. And if somebody were to make up this story of the revelation of Sinai, if it were a lie, somebody in the, in the history of Israel would have written a book about it and, and, uh, mm. and called them on it. Mm. And, um, and that's why, you know, you can't, you know, you can, you can, you can collude between, you, know, you can have collusion between a few witnesses, a couple dozen witnesses, maybe a few hundred, but hundreds of thousands of people, you're not going to get them, you know, uh, to, to, uh, all, all, uh, support a story unless it's actually true. Mm. And I think that's what God is saying, that they will believe in you forever. They'll know that this isn't just some made-up thing, that God really spoke to hundreds of thousands of people mm. in order so that they would know that his servant Moses is really speaking the truth, that he's a true prophet. Amen. Amen. So it's not just a matter of one or two witnesses. We're talking about hundreds right. and thousands or hundreds of thousands of hundreds people. Hundreds of thousands, yeah. Amen. Yeah. And, uh, and just to emphasize, you, you mentioned, uh, you translated it as, and believe in you, or in you believe forever. And uh, so once again, behold, I am coming to you in the thick of the cloud, in order that uh, the people will hear when I speak with you, 
and also in you they will believe forever. And that's really interesting. What he's saying mm -hmm. is um, that, I mean, that's the purpose of this revelation, that they're going to know that um, I'm, I'm speaking to you, that you're not just making this up. There really is a, a voice that you're hearing. And it's not just a, mm -hmm. you know, uh, some nut out in, the, out in the cave in the desert. Amen. So my, my English translation, again, it, it misses in. Uh, it just says, believe you forever. What, what do you have in the NIV, Keith? Well, it says that uh, we'll always put their trust in you. Um, you know, the NIV uh, translators get nervous <laughs> about this idea of believing in Moses. I mean, there's only one that you're supposed to believe in, so they, they, don't, they don't feel comfortable doing that. So they just say, we'll put... They'll always put their trust in you. So, I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, it's not what it says, but I mean, okay. And, and can sure. I point out that the same exact phrase, we have the word to believe, and we follow by the preposition in, connected with the, used with the preposition in, in Genesis 15, 6, where it's mm -hmm. talking about Abraham believing in Yehovah. It says, and he believed in Yehovah, and it was uh, reckoned for him as righteousness. righteousness. So that's Amen. the same exact phrase, to believe in. And uh, how is it translated there in the NIV? Out of curiosity, does it say he trusted it? Trusted him? Or that's a good. That's a good. You know what it says. Fifteen. It says. Sorry, fifteen verse six. Verse six. In the King says, James, it says, "And he believed in the Lord." Yeah. So what I've got, uh, yeah, he in believed King. in the Lord, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. In the nearly inspired version, it says, "And it says, and he crit, um, and Abraham believed in the Lord." You, Yes. Yeah, so you're allowed to say it there. You're allowed to say it there, but you can't say it in conjunction with Moses. All right. I think we've made our point. Moving along. Three days. They've got to wash their clothes. That's a good idea. And they've got to uh, consecrate themselves three days uh, and, and set themselves apart at the base of the mountain. They're not allowed to come to it. They're not allowed to touch it. If they do, death. And uh, so 14, Moses went down to the mountain. The sound effects. And, and yeah, <laughs> high-tech sound effects here on Truth To You. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people, sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, be ready on the third day. Do not come near your wives. Now, are we talking about possible, uh, possibly becoming unclean in regards to laws of Nida? We haven't discussed that yet. That's Leviticus, what, 15, I think. Um, is that possibly what it's referring to? Does that make sense? Well, I don't think it has to do with Nida. I think it has to do with Shechvat Zera. But we'll talk about that in Leviticus 15. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Basically, he was saying for these three days, and by the way, when he says three days, he means today, tomorrow, and the next day. Uh, so in our terms, we would say that's two days from now, but in Hebrew, that's uh, ah. for the, thir the third day or the three days, um, in three days' time. Uh -huh. um, and he's talking about not having sex with their wives so that they, mm -hmm. you know, they wouldn't be ritually impure because the significance of that is you can't enter into the temple. Well, the place where God revealed himself to Moses mm. at Mount Sinai, he said to him, take off your shoes because this is a holy place. Yes. And so when you're dealing with a holy place, when you approach a holy place, you need to be in a state of ritual purity. You can't touch a dead body or various other things that are in mm -hmm. Numbers 19 and Leviticus 15 and other passages, Leviticus 11. There's a whole bunch of rules about that. There it is. Yes. Keith, Keith you're gonna, you, you'll are gonna be excited about this. Verse 16, when it came to pass on the third day, as the, on. in the morning, they, they were thick. Wait, are you going to give a sound effect, Keith? Go get your this, shoulder. We need, we need it. We need sound. Have you got it? No, there? we really need it. No, 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 we no, really no, no. Can All we I'm wake, up, you is, wake up your neighbors listen, at eight in the morning? No, no we really listen, need listen. <laughs> if you don't no, pull no. the shofar, Keith, I will. No, no. Okay, just a minute, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> go get okay, go get it. Get it. Hold on, please. No, hold on. Okay, okay. <laughs> He's going to get it. I can't. That's possibly awesome. Do it because it's 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 twelve thirty in the morning here, and and everyone will. I'll wake everyone up. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. That wouldn't be good. All right, we're talking about uh, there were thunderings and there were lightnings and there was a thick cloud on the mountain and, and, then, and, then, and then the blowing of the shofar. The sound of the trumpet was very loud. And it literally said... That's me blowing the shofar, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, and, uh, thank you. Really I had to do it just in case Nehemia would have uh, grabbed his shofar. But a bit of disaster. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that interesting? That this statement and it says the kol shofar chazak ma'od and and the uh, sound of the shofar was chazak ma'od. It was very chazak. It was very strong. And then he goes back to that in verse nineteen. It says, mm. and it came to pass the shofar, the sound of the shofar was continually growing stronger. I mean, yes, that's, yes, yes. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. I mean, that is, that's who, awesome. And who is blowing this shofar? Who is that's blowing the shofar? It was, was it the shofar up on Mount Sinai. 
and oh, no, this is, that's pretty cool look, guys this this is so amazing to me because when i think about this and i i know you know Nehemi and i we, he makes jokes about me with the shofar but let me tell you something this is like <laughs> so a holy it's, the, really the, the sound is. itself the sound itself changes things in me there are just there's something about it but imagine standing there if i could just take a moment just imagine standing there before you ever get to the actual wonderful thing that we have to stop at uh when he, when he makes his introduction you've got this pre uh this preparatory you know it's like uh you know like i used to like, like i used to tell people all the time when i was was with the vikings um they'd do all of this stuff that would happen before the introduction mm -hmm. Of the players and they'd beat the drums and believe it or not with the minnesota vikings they actually would blow something that sounded like a shofar Doo -doo! that was the you know the the yeah oh it was, it was really quite interesting so they would blow this and they would have this beating and this drumming and a motorcycle and 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 smoke and all this and i think wow folks get all riled up but these folks when they heard this it caused great fear in them oh, and i yeah, i can and i can understand why mm. i mean can and you that, imagine the it, sounds and that was the point can, too wasn't it uh, and that, can can we stop here and pray for a minute oh yes yes can, yes, can we yes, do that? yes that's a fine yes. idea please okay um yehovah avinu shabash shemayim elohenu velohe avotenu tenu lishmoa et kol hashofar kadei she'enenu tipatachna kifi shenifkuchu enei yisrael besinai kadei shenirei Nabit Beniflaot Toratecha. Yehovah, Father in heaven, God of uh, our fathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let us hear the sound of the shofar. Yes. That our eyes be open, as Israel's eyes were opened at Sinai, mm -hmm. that we may see the wonderful hidden things of your Torah. Amen. 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 Keith, Brilliant. you must blow the shofar. Yes, I will blow it again. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, fellas. And so, yes, thunderings, lightnings, thick cloud on the mountain. The sound of the trumpet was very loud, the sound of the shofar. And all the people that were in the camp trembled. They trembled. And Moses brought uh, the people out of the camp to meet with God. Oh, my goodness. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now, Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because Jehovah descended upon it in fire. Uh -huh. Oh, man, it's like a volcano. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the shofar sounded, it, it sounded long. It became louder and louder. And Moses spoke, and God answered him mm. by voice. Can you imagine it? Oh my oh. goodness! And uh, and then Jehovah came down upon the mount of Mount Sinai on top of the mountain. Jehovah called Moses. Now this is. I, no, wait, this is I've, got, I've got to stop, Jonah. Can we just hey. ask a question? Can we just hey. ask a question? In just a casual reading, mm. the casual reading says. There's a conversation going on before the creator of the universe speaks. Mm. Is, is, mm -hmm. is that is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. Oh, definitely. So then, so then, so I mean, I'm not trying to be funny here, but okay. So uh, uh, Moses says, "Okay, uh, Yehovah, now are we standing in the right place?" Yes, you're standing in the right place. Mm. Okay, Yehovah, are the people prepared? Yes, they're now. Pre I mean, is this? I mean, is this the kind of thing we're talking about? Did the it, people hear this conversation back and forth? I. I, I, you know, he spoke to them in a voice, and but the That's funny thing says. about it, the funny thing about it is that uh, there's a conversation. At least, at least words have been exchanged um, between Moses and Yehovah upon the mountain. But then, but then Yehovah he, he called to Moses and says, "Hey, come up here." And so he goes up, and then Yehovah says, "Hey, go down." <laughs> <laughs> but I was down there, and you were talking to me. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, he's but, going to say uh, something privately now. It's about to be private. So I guess that must be what it is. And he says, go down and warn the people lest they break through. Uh, this is stuff he's already told them. But, but, and, and basically, this is what Moses says uh, to Yehovah. And Yehovah says, hey, away, get down, do what you're told, and then come up, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and, and the people break through to come to Yehovah lest he break out against them. Now, the, the, the word here is interesting because... It says, uh, "Come up to Yehovah, lest He break out against them." Is it a is it an angel speaking to them? Nehemiah, what's what's your thoughts there in the way that that's written? Um, is Yehovah you know, speaking I, I about himself I, in the third person, I, or I, you know that actually happens quite a bit? There's many passages where Yehovah speaks about himself in the third person, oh. so I, I don't see any problem with that whatsoever. Yeah. And I'm inclined not to to say not to say it's an angel because it doesn't say anywhere that this is an angel. 
Mm -hmm. And um, and this is look, this is the revelation at Sinai. I mean, if he was going to speak directly to the people, this was the time. And, that, and that's what it, it says. It says mm -hmm. it says that, th that, you know, there's never been another incident in the entire history of mankind in which God took a nation and spoke to them. I mean, this is yeah. it. This is it. And so Moses this went is, down. This is, the, this is the time. This is not the time for angels. This is the time for Jehovah to actually speak to the people. Amen. Right. And so, yeah, Keith. Well, I'm just saying, as we get to verse 20, I, I have to I have to spend a card here, ladies and gentlemen. I have to I have to slow down and say something here, mm. because you know we, they have this interaction back and forth, back and forth, and I just think it's and I just please bear bear with me. This this verse has at different times uh, caught my attention, and most recently in 2009, Nehemiah and I were in Colorado Springs, and as we were in Colorado Springs. I was supposed to meet him in Colorado Springs. A long story. I talk about it. My plane is stuck. Stuck. I'm not able to get there. I'm going to be there the next day. I come home and do something I have not done in the Hebrew Bible. This is back in the old days, in my Methodist days, where you didn't know what to read. You'd open up a part of the Bible, and it would come to that section. Well, I came home and opened up the Bible, and I was on in, in Exodus chapter 20, and 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 in verse uh, two in in my Bible, and and I have to. I I just can't. I can't say it the way that it says it in my NIV. So I want to know if I can get a, a card from Jono and Nehemiah to simply say what jumped off the page for me. Is that okay? Can I mm. do it in Hebrew? Would that be all right with you all? Oh, the please. Methodist kind of translations Shabbat. from, thank mm, you. Please. So in verse 2 it says, in my, in my NIV, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And when I read that, it just doesn't have the same effect as when I read it in Hebrew because it says, Anochi Yehovah And when I saw those three words... And it, it happens to use anochi. Sometimes, you know, you'll see ani, ani, I am Yehovah. Mm -hmm. This is, happens to be one where he says anochi. And when the, when I saw those three words, it jumped off the page and, and kind of cracked me in the head. This is the first words out of his mouth. He didn't, he, you know, it's like, okay, let me let me start off, he says, and tell you my name. Mm -hmm. And just in case there's any confusion that you might think that we're dealing with the gods of before, maybe you think I'm the god of fire. Maybe you think I'm the god of smoke of the shofar. All those things are wonderful things. But Anochi Yehovah Eloheka, I am, and then he mm. says his name, 6,828 mm. times in scripture. He proclaims this for everyone <clears throat> to hear. And there's no uh, sleight of hand. There's no title he's using. There's no, hey, it's too holy. To, he proclaims his name. So people say to me, look, we should not call him by his name. You know, he didn't come and say, I am the father. Call me the father. He says, Anohi Yehovah, I am, and then he says his name. And I'm going to tell you something. When I read that uh, back in 2009, I knew then for sure I had to um, go forward with this information because this introduction is crucial to us understanding how he introduces himself. Mm -hmm. He introduced himself to the mixed multitude of nations by his name. Mm. I am Yehovah, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Before me? What does it mean to have no other gods before him? Like, mm. you know, that he can see or, 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 you know, if you've got God number one, God number two, God number three, that he's not to be number three or number two. What does it mean before him? Well, I think Nehemiah. this is rightfully translated by many people as in my presence. Literally mm. means literally on my face is literally mm. what it says. Mm -hmm. You shall know other gods on my face. But that's a Hebrew idiom that means in my presence. Okay. Hey, you know, this is arguably one of, arguably this is the most important passage in the Tanakh, mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. Bible. Because these are the words that Yehovah spoke himself to every man, woman, and child of the children of Israel. And uh, it's actually the only passage, this and when it's repeated in, um, in the book of Deuteronomy, it's the only mm -hmm. passage that in, in Jewish tradition, when they, they, every week they read the Torah portion like what we're doing, we're doing these Torah portions. Well, they read the, the Torah portion every week in the Jewish synagogues, and this is the only passage where the entire congregation in, in many synagogues will stand up. Throughout the uh, year, as they're reading the Torah portions, the, the, the reader is standing up, but the congregation are sitting in their seats and they're following along in their Bibles. But when it comes to this passage, the entire congregation stands up. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you, I know we're, we're short on time and we probably run over, but if you'd let me, Jono and Keith, uh, I can spend a card if Keith likes to say, I'd like to be able to read this passage from beginning to end in Hebrew, uh, the way it's read in synagogues. I'm not going to do it with the cancellation because I, I can't carry a tune. I'm going <laughs> to read you 
read you the Hebrew wait. words. But, what, what, wait. Well, before hey. you do this, yeah. we're, 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 yeah. we're, 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 everybody that's listening, we're all going to stand up, right? I mean, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to okay. stand up too. Well, I guess I have to pick up my microphone, but yep. please okay. stand up. I mean, are Here you kidding go. me? Okay, I'm, 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 I'm standing up. up. I'm standing up. All right. Australia, United so here States. Goes. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Mm-hmm. I'm moving my microphone. Hang on. Stand up, Jono. I'm getting up. Hang on a second. Whoa. Okay. All right. I'm standing up. Hey, I'm tall. It's a big deal. Yeah. So the first verse in, in English, I'll read it. And literally, an Elohim spoke all these words, saying, Anochi Yehovah Elohecha, asher otzitiha me'eret Mitzrayim mi'bet avadim. Lo yihia lecha Elohim acherim al panai, lo ta'asa lecha feser v'chol tumuna asher b'shamayim mi'ma'al. ושבמים <אז> ביום השביעי, שבת ליהובה אלוהיך, לא תעשה כל מלאכה, אתה ובנך וביתך עבדך ועמתך ובהמתך וגרך אשר בישעריך, כי שבת ימים עשה יהובה את השמיים ואת הארץ, את הים ואת כל אשר בם, והיה נך ביום השביעי, על כן ברך יהובה את יום השבת ויקדשהו. כבד את אביך ואת אמך, למען יאריכון ימיך האדמה אשר יהובה אלוהיך נותן לך. לא תרצח, לא תנאף, לא תגנוב. לא תענה ברעך עד שקר, לא תחמוד בית רעך, לא תחמוד אשת רעך, ועבדו, ועמתו, ושורו, וחמרו, וכל אשר לרעך. אמן. תודה רבה. אמן ואמן. אני אגיד לך מה, אני הייתי כבר ready to start dancing up as I'm standing up, you know. When you hear, when you hear, these, when you hear these words and understand, and as those of us that are listening, that believe that these are the actual words of the creator of the universe spoken mm-hmm. to all of, all of mankind, And now for there to be this debate of deciding whether or not we need to deal with these words or not, or if these words are any good anymore, or whether these words are even applicable anymore. Certainly, they just uh, are, are words that we look at a historical context, but we're so thankful that we don't have to deal with these words anymore. We got a different way. And uh, when, I hear, when I hear those words, I know from me and my heart, it excites me that we got a chance to not only read these words, to understand these words, mm. but to apply these words in our lives. And, and uh, you can't... And- you can't uh, hear those words and, and without having to ask the question, um, what am I doing about it? <laughs> mm, yeah, amen. Yes, amen. Yeah, I mean, I mean. Excellent. All right, putting my, putting my microphone back down. Okay. Hey. Okay, all right. Thank you, uh, Nehemiah, for that. Thank you, Nehemiah Gordon. <clears throat> Look, Excellent. I'm going to tell you something. I mean, I'm dealing with this guy for all these years. Listen, he doesn't – this isn't something, you know, where – the thing that hit me more than anything 10 years ago is to sit down and we're reading and he's reading and, and, and he's, he's actually reading it and it's not just a – Uh, reference uh, words but actual words on living words on the on the page so uh, it's just been exciting to to uh, walk along with you Nehemi it's really been an honor and a blessing and uh, you've spurred me on my friend brilliant and uh, now all the people witnessed the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the shofar and the mountain smoking and when the people saw it they trembled and stood far off and then they said to Moses you, look you <laughs> you speak with us And we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. Mm-hmm. Okay, what, mm-hmm. what, uh, how, do we, how are we to understand that? Well, they're terrified. If he gives all the commandments like this, they, they're afraid they're going to die. I mean, it's that, it's that terrifying mm-hmm. that they, they honestly think that their lives are at stake. Well, can you imagine yeah. thunder, quaking, fire, smoke, sounds, words, and the words that are spoken from a voice that who knows, maybe it was like rushing waters and... Who knows what this voice was like, but I mean, imagine mm. hearing the voice of the creator of the universe speak. Mm. You know, I, I mean, look, I, I, <laughs> I can't imagine. I can't imagine. I mean, I think it's an amazing picture that I can't even wrap my mind around. It is. It's mind-blowing. And Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that, so that you may not sin. So clearly this is the point of the whole uh, exercise, not just to give the words – But to, uh, but to show them how incredibly powerful he is so that they think twice before they, before they broke his commandments, to, to literally instill in them the, the fear of Yehovah, the fear of the Lord. It's fair enough? Yes. It's okay. interesting because you know, I'm, I'm currently finishing up a, a book uh, on the priestly blessing, and, and one of the things my editor keeps telling me is he says, Nehemiah, don't tell, show. And, uh, and she means you know, literarily, 
But that's what God did here. Rather than telling them, I'm very powerful, I'm very awesome, I'm very amazing. Instead of just telling them that, he showed them. And mm. they experienced it for themselves. Mm. Amen. Amen. So the what people stood thing. People stood afar off, uh, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Uh, so these are the final verses. Then Jehovah said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. How about that? I mean, it just I have talked to you. You shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves an altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it the burnt offerings, your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. Keith, you ready for it? <laughs> nope, here it is. No. Here it is. Here no, is no, the... No, listen, I'm still stuck on this. I mean, I, 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 I must... I, I'm... You know, I know that people have to be listening to this, uh, this, this, this show, and they've got to say what you know. We've heard the, we've heard the Hebrew, and we've, we've heard the discussion, and, and we, we were not able to go line by line because we don't have time. But I want to a- encourage people to do something before we get to this Moneyball verse for me, and mm. that is to do something that uh, Nehemiah actually um, showed us in the very beginning. Uh, what he did that was so powerful, and I don't know if people caught this or not, but um, one of the things that we he did was we started with Jethro. And we ended up all the way in Chronicles, I think. <laughs> yes. And what was po- yeah, yeah no, what was powerful <laughs> about that was what was powerful about that is, is is a way to study, and to make the connections. And I think people would be really surprised if they took. And I want to encourage people to be like the Bereans to check the scripture mm-hmm. and to, to go into depth on this. Every word, even in English, the every word that our Creator commanded, go through, through those words and see where else those words are used and do your own study. And you might be a bit shocked by what you're going to learn. So I'm going to encourage people to do that. And then, of course, after we get through all those powerful words and powerful phrases, then he does this little deal. Then he adds to the, the verse. And I think you're going to you're going to go to 24. Is that right? Mm-hmm. It says, uh, make an altar of earth for me. Sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your fellowship offerings, your sheep and goats and your cattle. And I think that that's where I thought the verse was supposed to stop. But then it does something really powerful in my English Bible. It says, whenever I cause my name to be honored, I will come to you and bless you. That's what the NIV says. And if I stick to it, I'm just going to honor his name. And uh, honoring his name might mean, you know, I'm going to, who knows what honoring his well, name means. I've got what a different it's... word. I've got a different word here, Keith. What does it yours says, say? In every place where I record my name, I will come oh. to you and I will bless you. Oh, so wherever he, wherever he records it. So mm-hmm. for me, it's wherever I honor it, wherever he records it. Can we ask, Nehemiah, are you in the bathroom or are you still here? <laughs> no, I'm still here. <laughs> okay, so can you, could you please read it in Hebrew for us? In every place that I cause my name to be mentioned, I oh, will wait. come to you and I will bless you. Wait, 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 wait. No, so you're telling me if you were to read that in Hebrew, it would actually tell you to mention his name? Uh, Where he causes, he causes his, causes name, his to... name to be mentioned, he's going to bless you in those places. He doesn't say in every place I cause my name to be mentioned, I will come and curse you because my name is forbidden to speak. It's too holy to speak. On the contrary, he says every place I cause my name to be mentioned, there I will come to you and bless you. Mm-hmm. Amen. Well, the reason it excites me is that when we slowed down and looked and at here, this verse... And here, let me, let, me, let me read this to you from the JPS, the Jewish Publication Society, published in 1985. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, that's a rabbinical translation. And they have, in every place where I cause my name to be mentioned, I will come to you and bless you. JPS. Mm. Sure. There's the JPS. So the idea being that uh, we do have an opportunity to mention his name. That's it doesn't it say every place, I, every place I cause my title to be mentioned. It doesn't say that. Mm-hmm. It says every place I cause my name to be mentioned. So what an opportunity. And he, and he ties this with the issue of the altar. And we've talked about this before, but why this is so powerful is that this, the idea is that the altar would be set up and from the altar, then they would call upon the name. So the connection between the altar and calling upon his name is a, is a close connection. And, um, and here, right here, right after all of these powerful words that he speaks, he says... He says right here, I'm expecting that you're going to call upon uh, my name. In fact, when I cause you to call upon it and mm. mention it, I will come to you myself and bless you. So bless you. may it be for everyone that we learn about okay. his name and who he is and his introduction mm. of who he is in his words. And not simply just mentioning his name with our mouth, but understanding it in our heart, our minds, his character, and being people that would truly honor his name by understanding, living by his name, calling upon his name, and being a people um, who want to walk by his words. Yes. Amen. 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 Okay. Hey, can I point something out, Jonah and Keith? And, and I want to challenge you, the two of you, yeah. which is, you know, we, we, we basically we skipped over the Ten Commandments. And I think the reason we did that is, is there's kind of this notion that, well, everybody knows what these are. So we're not going to spend any time talking about these. But from speaking to people around the world, I've realized that 
the understanding of the Ten Commandments is um, really elementary and, and, and in fact wrong very often, uh, especially when they're read in English. And so what I want to challenge the two of you to do is that when we get to Deuteronomy and we come to the, t- the Ten Commandments repeated, that we go mm. through each and every one of the commandments yes. and we ask what it means in its context, based in its language, and understand it. Because to just skip over the Ten Commandments, I'm, I'm really not at ease there. We've got to go through them one by one and talk about Amen. what they mean because because there's bil- over a billion people in the world who claim they believe in these commandments, and half of them, more than half of them, don't even know what these commandments are. Mm-hmm. Don't even and that's why the Nehemiah, basic meaning of what these commandments are. Here's what I love yeah. about this, Jonah, and I know we're at the end. That's why I said that if people will go through this and make connections, they'll find that in Deuteronomy. And we get to Deuteronomy, we're going to have a whole section just on this because it it is powerful to hear Moses retell what it was that happened back then. And that, I mean, that's why you guys, you're not missing anything. Study yourself so you're ready when mm-hmm. we get to Deuteronomy. It's going to be powerful. Deuteronomy Thank chapter you. 5, if I yes. remember correctly, we'll do a two-hour program on uh, and, and go yes. through it in detail. The Ten yes. Commandments and the retelling of That's... the words. And uh, But we have but the two very, very vital verses. We can't let it go there. This is the way it ends. And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it. From hewn stone you shall use, for, for if you use a tool on it, you have profaned it. And what? most of what? <laughs> what? Hey? If you use a tool it on it, you have profaned it. If you wave a sword upon it, you have desecrated it. Oh, wow. And, and, the, and the thinking there is that when you hew stones, you use iron, you use metal, mm-hmm. and that same metal is used to kill. It's used for death. And that must not be used to create the altar of Jehovah, something that a tool that can also be used for death. Come on, somebody. Wow. Mm-hmm. All right. I wasn't expecting that, Torah Pell, but there you go. I, that's That's fascinating. And most important of all, here we go. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness um, may not be exposed on it. It's important. And I'm very grateful for that commandment. That should, that <laughs> Wear underwear. There. Wear underwear is let's the final commandment. No, there's of, Jono and Nehemiah again, ladies and gentlemen. The final Please, commandment of, okay. of this week's Torah portion. Uh, the final thought is wear underwear when you're going up steps. Um, Nehemiah Gordon and Keith Johnson, thank you for coming back on Pearls from the Torah portion, my friends. It's always a blessing to have you Can on I just the program. Say one last word to you know, in closing, which is Yehovah, I pray, please let me have the obedience to your commandments mm. of the Rechites and love you yeah. to, with the love of Georgia. Oh. Amen. Oh, that's Amen. Brilliant. Thanks, thanks, Nehemiah. Thanks for uh, Jono. Thanks for having us here. And we do, uh, we do appreciate the fact that we could honor uh, Georgia during this uh, this time. She was a great dog. Mm, absolutely. She, she's oh dear. And so now, usually we go out with a, uh, a guitar track from my sister's album, The Left Over Sea, which is available from Truth to You. But instead, I'm going to leave you with a guitar instrumental by yours truly. This uh, is I'm going to entitle this Memories of Georgia, and I hope you enjoy it. Next week, we are in Mishpatim, Exodus 21, verse 1 to 24, 18. And until then, dear listener, be blessed and be set apart by the truth of our Father's word. Shalom. Thank mm-hmm. you.